There's absolutely no better way that we could start worship. So, on that beautiful note, good morning to all of you. Good morning and welcome to First Methodist Church. We're glad for all of you being present today, particularly any of you who are here as guests, new residents. Um, we're excited this morning that as a congregation, we have a chance to participate in, in Alice Caroline's baptism, and we look forward to that. Uh, I would ask all of you, if you don't mind, to look for the attendance pad, that, that black pad that's nearby. If you'd sign your name and share it with others, we always appreciate you doing that. Toward the end of the service, there'll be a, uh, an invitation given for any of you who've been visiting for a while. If today's the day that you'd like to become a part of this church so that your faith journey can combine with all the journeys here, uh, we'd be excited about that. We would love to welcome you today. Um, you know, in the service today, uh, we get a chance as a congregation to welcome back our children's choir and our junior worship leaders. Now that school's going again, today is going to be the first day that they will be singing for us in worship. Uh, they'll be entering in a few moments, and when the appropriate time comes, I hope that all of you will make certain that they know that you appreciate their presence, because if we didn't have children in worship, we would not be a church. So thank goodness for them. Uh, I'm also grateful, you see in your bulletin, that this morning we have a guest musician from TCU. Uh, during our offertory, our guest cellist will be playing, and we say good morning to him and thank you to him. The one thing I want to push this morning that you see in the bulletin um, is the fall women's retreat. Uh, many of you have seen a brochure that looks like this. It's available now um, at the Welcome Center. It's available in the church office. From that, you'll notice that the retreat is going to be the first weekend of November, the 5th to the 7th. It's at Stillwater Lodge in Glen Rose. This is now a United Methodist facility that is absolutely beautiful. If you haven't been to Stillwater before, in addition to the, the content of the retreat, just going to be in that beautiful place is worth it. And then the content will be incredible. The leaders are Phyllis McDougall, Linda McDermott, Paige Hines, and then all of you who will participate and take part of that. So I know that some people signed up for it after the first service today, and I hope that you're able, if you're able to go, why don't you sign up today? Now, before we begin our service, as we always do, I want to ask you if you would take a moment to make sure that everybody around you has been noticed and greeted. So would you stand for a moment to say good morning and to offer others the peace of Christ, please? Uh, during the service, if you want to continue to greet our youth in the West Balcony, I recommend the Little Rascals High Sign. If you do that, they will respond immediately. Well now, as we prepare ourselves for worship, let's now quietly prepare ourselves through Aaron's prelude. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Tim Brewster, Senior Pastor of First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth. Welcome to this service of worship. I'm glad you've chosen to join us in this broadcast of our 11 o'clock worship service. And I hope you can join us in person at one of our services at 8.30 in the chapel, 9.30 in the sanctuary, 11 o'clock in the sanctuary, and at 11.11 in Wesley Hall. On behalf of the whole congregation of First United Methodist Church, I welcome you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us pray. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon where there is their own. Faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in the giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen.
invite the children to come down to our usual spot for our time together. Come on. Thistle. This will be a children's message about doors. You ready? We're going to take a, I know that was hysterical. All right. We are going to take a look at some doors and see if we can figure out what would be in the places where those doors are. Let's see, where's door number one? Where, ah, here's door number one right here. What do you think would be inside if we went through that door? What do you think? What do you think over here? Can you see? Wait, there's an apple and there's numbers and letters of the alphabet. What do you think? A school. A school. A school's exactly right. And we go to a school, we go in through that door to a school where we would learn lots of stuff. But you know what's just as important? To go outside that door. Because if we learn all that stuff in the school, but we don't go back out that door into the world, then all that, all that knowledge we have in our heads isn't going to do us any good. I wonder where door number two is. Where's door number two? Do you see door number two? Ah, here's door number two over here. Now, let's take a look at this. What do you think would be behind door number two? What do you think? A doctor, right? We see the Band-Aids and the stethoscope and... Yeah, and when we go to the doctor, that's a place where we go to get better, isn't it? When we're feeling sick or we're not feeling well, it's a place where we can go and we go to get better. But it doesn't do any good if we just stay in the doctor after we've gotten well, right? We need to open that door back up and we need to go out in the world being well after we've gotten better. I wonder where door number three is. Can you help me find door number three? Ah, here's door number three. Well, I wonder what would happen if we went through... Construction, building stuff, yeah, maybe like a hardware store or a tool shed. Yeah, who knows, but we've got all these tools, and if we went through that door, we would have all the tools to help us fix things and to help us build things. But if we go in through that door and we get all the tools and we don't go back out that same door out of the world, well, how are we going to build anything? We'll just have the tools. Where's door number four? Can you help me find door number four? Oh, here's door number four. Now, what do you think? What do you think here? Oh, it's a store, like a, like, a gro like a market, like a grocery store, right, where we can go to get food. We can get fruits and bread and Swiss cheese and all that kind of stuff, artichokes and Brussels sprouts and all those things to help us grow and to be healthy. But if we go into the market and we get the food, but we don't bring it out, we're not going to be able to eat. It's really important to go out, but I have an idea. Say, what's your idea, Mr. Mark? Thank you for asking. I wonder what would happen if we put all these doors together. Let's give it a shot. I wonder what would happen. As to, let's come right back to here so everybody on both sides can see. Uh-huh. Yeah. Look. And right. Yeah. Uh-huh. That makes one big door. Where do you think that door would lead? What kind of place? A church. That's exactly right. Give your brains a kiss for that one. Yeah. Whew. Otherwise, this children's moment was going to have a rough ending. All right. Yeah. And a church is a place where we can go to learn. And a church is a place where we can go to get healing and feel better. And a church is a place where we can have the tools to build and make the world better. And a church is a place where we can go and get... What's that? Yeah, a church, yes. A church is a place where we could go to get all the nutrients we want. Now, here's the thing about this door. In a church, doors do not have exits. They have two entrances. One entrance is into the building, and the other entrance is into the world. <laughs> That's, thank you.
My middle name is High Tech. Yeah. <laughs> so just remember, you're not leaving through that door. You are entering into the world where all of those things that you get here will be important, will make your life better, will make the lives of everyone else better. Knock, knock. Let us, let us pray. Dear God, there are so many doors in your world. Help us remember that the door into your church is a door into ourselves and it's a door into the world. There is no exit in your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a great day. Y'all take care. The baptism of infants is a sacred time in the life of the church, as it is a sacred time in the life of a family. And all of our children are sacred and special to our church, and today is no exception, as today we'll be, we will be baptizing the granddaughter of Dr. Brewster. Um, Tim and Susan have commissioned a special piece to be played. In just a moment, you will hear that to commemorate this very special day in their lives. And at this time, I would ask Sarah and Stephen Pepper to bring their daughter, Alice, forward for infant baptism.
Beloved of God, baptism is a sign to us of the mercy and the grace of God. It is a sacrament indicating that we do not come into this relationship on the basis of anything that we have done or anything that we have accomplished, but God's gracious invitation of love toward us. Infant baptism is an especially appropriate demonstration of this kind of grace. As we remember the words of Jesus when he said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such as these belongs the kingdom of God. And I ask you now, as you stand before God in this congregation, do you affirm your faith in Christ? And do you promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, all nations, and all races? And will you nurture it? See, I knew one of us was going to cry, <laughs> or maybe both of us. Will you nurture Alice Caroline in Christ's holy church? Will you finish for me? <laughs> and will you accept for her the responsibilities of raising her in the church, in the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races in Crete? Alice Caroline, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Now if you'll place your hands on her. <laughs> Alice Caroline, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you'll remain a faithful <laughs> disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? Oh, it's okay. That's all right. I cried too, so it's okay. <laughs> what a blessing it is for all of us to welcome Alice Caroline as a member of this faith community and um, to pledge ourselves to do all that we can to uphold her in the faith and to nurture her in the faith so that as she grows up among us, she will stand at this or some other altar and make her own profession of faith in Christ. And all of this is God's wonderful gift offered to us without price. And let us respond. With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that Alice Caroline, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. My soul is satisfied as with a rich feast, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I think of you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night.
stand as we affirm our faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life and death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. sits in a hospital room in a strange city, their beloved recovering from surgery. The experts have finished a complicated procedure. The beloved struggles to recover. The drugs to break the pain suppress consciousness. The spouse keeps watch for days, sitting alone, feeling helpless, unable to do anything to help. This one yearns for a friend to come and lay a hand upon his shoulder, saying, I don't know how you're doing this. But no one comes. But someone comes. Passing through the walls and doors was that you and your spirit, O oh Jesus. A family with a long and deep-seated resentments, old wounds, grievances, grudges, never resolved, sits in their living room and for the first time in 20 years, they talk. They seek to understand one another and the other's point of view. And there is forgiveness and reconciliation, a family hug, and afterwards a prayer of thanksgiving. Passing through the doors and walls of separation, was you and your spirit there, O oh Jesus? Palestinian and Israeli sit at table, you and your spirit of love, O oh God, have already passed through the walls and sit at table with them. Will they sense your presence? Where there are doors and walls of separation, of fear, despair, hatred, you and your loving spirit, O oh God, have already entered the room. May we sense you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. <clears throat> Thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 22. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. Today is the second in a series of sermons called Rethink Church. It's a three-part series. We started last week, and the title of the series comes from a national uh, publicity campaign of the United Methodist Church, but it's really more than that. It's a, it's a call for everyone, uh, all the churches in the United Methodist Connection, uh, all the uh, folks who are uh, visitors to those churches and folks who've never set foot in our churches to think about uh, church, to rethink church, which means by the dictionary definition to think again or consider again, especially profoundly or especially with a view to changing one's opinions or tactics. That's the definition of rethink. And people everywhere, as I said last week, are rethinking virtually everything, whether the field is education or business or medicine or accounting or insurance or banking or construction. Everyone is engaged in rethinking because we live in a time of great change and rapid change. The advent of the digital age is like the advent of the printing press. And so how people think and relate and network and get things done and make money and spend money and lead and manage and every other facet of life, we, we're doing it differently now. And we're in the midst of changing from one way of doing things to another. 
And so everybody is feeling the stress of that, really. And they're rethinking. Rethinking is an important thing to do. To think again, especially profoundly. To reconsider, especially with a view uh, uh, of changing one's opinions or tactics. Rethinking. Today I want us to think about the church with 10,000 doors, 10,000 doors. I said last week that the younger generations, particularly the millennial generation, which is the youngest generation in adulthood, is often leading the change and resourcing the change that is taking place. And studies show that the millennial generation is not attending church at near the percentages that earlier generations did when they were the same age. And it's not because of the millennials, I'm convinced of that. It's because of the church. It's because of who we are and how we communicate who we are. Uh, millennials say that uh, they care very deeply, and I believe them. And they're spiritual, and I believe that too. They also challenge us to be our best as a church. And I mean that, the whole church and this congregation as well. Because if you ask them what they care about, they care about community and making connections. We talked about that last week. They care about their faith informing their action in the world and making the world a better place. Uh, they're not thinking much about when their generation passes from the scene. That's a long way off. But they're thinking when it does, they want the world to be a better place. And at our best, that's who we are to be as a church, too. I don't know if they would use this language, probably not, but they would agree that the church needs to have 10,000 doors. That they want to be a part of an institution or a movement or a congregation or a society or a club or anything else they're a part of. They want it to be open. And they want people to feel welcome there. And, and whatever we do uh, as a church or an institution, we don't want to do anything that would hurt their friends or embarrass their friends in any way or make them feel ostracized. All of that really challenges us and points us to rethink church, to think again about what it means to be an authentic follower of Jesus and how we live that out and how we live the way we say we believe. So today I want us to think about 10,000 doors. Let me, let me illustrate that briefly. If we look at the life of Jesus and we see who Jesus encountered. We see Jesus opening doors, opening doors, opening doors. 10,000, 100,000, a million, a billion, a trillion, opening doors endlessly for people. For, for example, immediately following our text for today, which is the evening of the first Easter, the evening of Resurrection Day, when the disciples are behind locked doors, they're afraid, uh, they've heard the women say that they've experienced the resurrected Christ, but they don't believe him. It's an idle tale, they say. And Thomas is not among them. Thomas is somewhere else. He's not with the group when Jesus comes to them behind locked doors and says, Peace be with you. And of course, the disciples are afraid at first. They don't know what to make of this, but then they they begin to realize we're in the presence of the resurrected Christ. The, the women were right. Their experience was authentic. And then Thomas rejoins the group later. And do you think Thomas believed their story? Well, of course he didn't. It's not that he thought his friends and fellow disciples were lying. Rather, Thomas, I'm sure, thought, yes, I want to believe that too, but I just can't. He said, unless I see it for myself, experience it for myself, I will not believe. And a week later, the risen Christ appears again, and there is Thomas among them. And he gives Thomas the opportunity to move through his doubt and come to faith when the time is right for Thomas. 
Now, what I want to really emphasize here is that Thomas was never removed from the community of the disciples. He was never asked to leave. He wasn't ostracized. He wasn't even criticized. Jesus certainly didn't condemn him for his doubt. Because the fact is, doubt is a part of faith. Everyone who has ever had faith has entertained doubt, and I and some have, um, you know, had it move in and stay a while. I, and that would be me among them. You know, but the thing about doubt is, and you can, well, St. Francis, whose prayer we prayed a moment ago, would be one as well. John Wesley. The thing about it is that it spurs you on so that when the time is right, you can come to faith, you can work through it and to a deeper faith. But when the time is right and not before, you can't force it. That's the way it is with doubt. But Thomas is fully a part of that faith community, doubts and all. Jesus created for him an open door. The community created for him an open door. And when the time was right, he could walk through it. But he was always welcome and a part of that. That's who we are to be as a community of faith. As followers of Jesus, those who create 10,000 doors for people struggling with doubt or holding fast to doubt or proclaiming doubt, experiencing doubt in any of its forms, there is an open door for you, if that's the place you're in. There's an open door for us to ask questions and to explore that. So that's what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus, opening doors to everyone. Take Matthew, the tax collector. There could not be a more hated group of people in uh, first century Palestine uh, among the Jews than tax collectors. They were sold out to the Roman Empire. They were part of a very corrupt system. They could bid whatever they wanted to bid, and if they got the bid, they would pay Rome what they agreed to pay, and then Rome would empower them with the force of the army to charge anything they wanted, whatever they could get out of the people they did. And so they became rich on the backs of the poor, and they impoverished others. They were hated. And here's Matthew sitting in his tax booth, and he's used to having glares and curses. He's used to being ostracized by everyone else. He's used to the Pharisees having nothing whatsoever to do with him. The Pharisees were righteous people seeking to be faithful to the covenant and following every letter of the law as they understood it. And that meant they were to separate themselves from anyone who didn't. In fact, the word Pharisee uh, is a derivative of the word for separate. That's who they were. And Matthew was used to that group separating themselves from him. And, uh, and he felt it every day, you can imagine. We don't know what all was going on with Matthew, but we can imagine that, uh, that it was wearing on him, who he had become and what he was engaged in. His parents named him Matthew, which means gift from God. But he probably didn't feel much like a gift from God. And then Jesus comes and looks at him in a way like no one else looked at him. Maybe in the way his mother had looked at him. We don't know. But with this kind of acceptance and love that he did not experience normally. And Jesus said, follow me. And he did. He left the tax booth right then and followed Jesus. And not only that, was well, that door open for Matthew? But Matthew immediately began to open doors for others. He had a party immediately. The next thing we read about in that text, Matthew holds a party and his friends come. Now, who are Matthew's friends? They're not Pharisees. They're not religious people. They're tax collectors and sinners. Sinners are those who don't follow the law. And, uh, and he has a big party for them. Jesus is there. And he eats and he drinks with these tax collectors and sinners and the Pharisees who have descendants among us today in every faith tradition. I think it's inappropriate to associate with those people. They're scandalized by Jesus' behavior. But Jesus opened doors, always opened doors. There was an open door for Matthew and his friends, and there's an open door for you, and we are called to be 
the church, who opens 10,000 doors for people who feel ostracized and set aside or despised even. That's who we are as followers of Jesus. A church with 10,000 doors is who we are called to be. Over and over again, we see this in Scripture. Zacchaeus, another tax collector who is a seeker. He wants to see Jesus. He wants to hear Jesus. He's a small man. He climbs up in a tree. And part of that may be self-protection to get out of the crowd so someone doesn't stick a knife in his back. And, uh, and Jesus invites him, invites himself to Zacchaeus' house for dinner. It is the ultimate act of reconciliation to sit down and eat with him. And Zacchaeus' life is completely changed. There was an open door for Zacchaeus. There's an open door for you. We're called to be the church to open 10,000 doors for people who are seeking a relationship with Jesus and may feel like they are unworthy even to be in the search so they keep their distance. May we be a church of 10,000 doors open to people who are seeking. How about Simon Peter? One of the inner circle of Jesus' disciples who, uh, to whom Jesus said, uh, Simon, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Simon Peter says, Lord, I would never deny you. And then he points to his colleagues. Now these other ones might deny you, but I would never deny you. And then what happens? The worst night of his life, the night of Jesus' arrest, and Simon is in the courtyard of Caiaphas, the high priest. He's sort of hanging around the edges near where Jesus is. Jesus is being led in chains through the courtyard. People confront Simon as he warms himself by a charcoal fire, and they say, ah, you know the, you know the Nazarene. You were with him. Three times that happens, and three times he denies knowing Jesus the third time with a curse. And then roosters begin to crow all over the place as morning is breaking. It is the worst night. To, to show you how Simon Peter must have felt about himself in relationship to the church, to the other believers, following the resurrection when the women uh, meet the risen Christ, he instructs them to go to the disciples and to say, uh, tell the disciples and Peter to meet me on the mountain in Galilee. And Peter. The disciples and Peter. Hmm. Is he not one of the disciples? He probably had considered himself no longer one of them. But be sure you tell the disciples and Peter meet me there. There's always an open door for Simon Peter, even after what he had done. And then the very last chapter of the Gospel of John is that beautiful scene where the risen Christ builds a campfire. You know what kind of fire it is? It's a charcoal fire. It's the only two places in the Gospels the word is used for charcoal fire. It's the same kind of fire that he builds on the, on the lake shore and he asks Simon Peter, as roosters are crowing all over the countryside and the sun is coming up, he asks him three times, do you love me? And Peter can answer three times, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Open door. The door was open for Simon Peter, and it's open for you. And we as a church are called to open 10,000 doors for people who need a second chance, a new start, a new beginning. Forgiveness. The ability to put the past in the past. Rethink church in that more profound way. How can we always open 10,000 doors to those in need of forgiveness and reconciliation and a new beginning and a new start? Now the list could go on and on and on. Throughout the Gospels we encounter so many people for whom the door is opened to a new life. In our text for today, Jesus appears to the disciples and he says, peace be with you. And then he says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And then he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And John wants us to make the connection with creation. God breathed life into Adam and there's new life. 
The risen Christ breathed the Holy Spirit into the church, and there's a new beginning, a new church. Energized. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And as God sent Jesus to open doors, open doors, open doors, so we are to be those who open doors. And so the church doors are always to be open. As Mark said, not a place to enter and then an exit, but two entrances. I like that. We enter into the church as the gathered people of God, and then we enter into the world and where we work and where we live to be God's people in the world, to, to open doors wherever we are. May we be a church, individually and collectively, of 10,000 doors. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for the door you open to new life, new beginnings, fresh starts, new insights, faith. May we, O oh God, be a church of 10,000 doors, times 10,000 doors. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Gracious God, as you have commanded us to love one another, accept these our gifts that we, they might be used to fling wide the doors of the church, that all who seek you might find your love. For we ask this in Christ's name, amen. As we remain standing for our closing hymn, I would invite any of you who would seek to join your membership with the life of this church to come forward as we sing. We'll be happy to meet you at the altar. soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen.